um, the breakdown of the room, it looks like that was mirrored from a, um, a similar office. You referenced Paul, but I don't know. I don't think I know who that is, but, um, is that right? Okay. So, um, it looks like the total for the equipment would be 1800 and that includes a sit to stand desk, a uh, file drawer unit, clamp mount logic, data and power and data at desktop, monitor arm, task chair, armchair, and file cabinets. Um, yeah, I guess Paul, Paul yeah. is another architect at uh, Megan's. Firm. I think I'd, I thought I'd referenced Phil. It was similar to Phil's oh, office. Phil, yeah. okay. Is it Phil? Where did I come up with Paul? Okay, Phil. Um, so yeah, so I don't know what we would like to discuss on that. I'm assuming if it matches everything that's pretty much on brand for the offices there, I, I don't have a particular issue with it. It doesn't sound like crazy out of the ballpark or anything like that. Um, if we break it down, this the sit to stand desk is 600. The file drawer unit with casters is 300. The clamp mount is 200. Monitor arm 175. Novo task chair 325 and armchair 200. I guess what's the difference between the, a task chair and an armchair? Is an armchair just for somebody to come in and sit? Like to visit? Yes, exactly. And the task chair is for the HR person to sit in, so it's more customizable and meant for longer sitting. Okay. So, yeah, I think the only discussion point really here is like Megan has prepared this to match the other offices in the building, mm -hmm. but I don't think that, you know, I, as the director can say, yes, I think you guys have to decide if you're going to recommend that to the full board and then recommend it to the full board next week. Or Megan, at, we can decide this at this committee level because that's the way we used to do it in design steering, correct? You, okay. The committee has a ten thousand dollar threshold to approve. Mm -hmm. So then, if you guys agree with it, um, then when Elise, you give the report at the um, uh, mm -hmm. meeting next week, you just say we agreed to eighteen hundred dollars to furnish the new office. So, okay. Megan, it's did that estimate include like carpet or um, anything like that, or are we just? going with the existing floor did not that was just the furniture and that was sort of the base level furniture so it was also um i sent it to natalie initially to get her feedback is it something that needs two side chairs um is, is there ever going to be a time when a second staff person or person needs to be in that office is there any other say, for file storage as well i would say if the two chairs fit in that room that we should have two chairs because there are times when um you know, an HR person would be meeting with uh, two employees. For example, we have one pair of employees that are married. Um, so they might be there talking about retirement or something like that, you know. Just a thought. Would that be three chairs all together? That would be three together, but that wouldn't leave us any space for like if a file, tall file cabinet or something might be needed. needed. So it depends on how much, depends on how much is in that space. In that space. Right, but if they have access, if we're going to put all of our files in that hallway that leads, you know, do, do they need to have files? You're right. I I don't know how you're going to use that room in comparison to the adjacent room that will have the file storage in it. I'm so for um, and and God knows things probably probably changed since the last time I was in an HR role, but there are. Um, like file storage, like personnel files. Personnel storage, files. storage rules. Um, um, so I don't know. So I don't know if you want to call the rest of the storage. It might be something that would be more, um, you know, discreet and safe in like an HR office. And I was just saying, in terms of an extra chair, um, could you just pull from other chairs that you already yeah, have? That you already have to get that easy chair. chair. To sit there, to sit there, to just be the needed, So, Natalie, do you and I agree that two chairs would be better? I think so. And and to Alicia's point, I think I mean I think we could pull from from somewhere else. I mean, but just I can't think of approximate location. 
to pull from because at the admin office, I guess if you went into Luann's office, you could take her extra chair. Well, I mean, is it aren't they the same kind of chairs that's in like Tawasentha or they're similar, yes. Help? Yeah. So I mean there's a lot of chairs in, in Tawasentha. I mean, couldn't we just take one for those? I mean my for me. from my perspective if if there's only room for one or the other i share a similar sort of um assumption that there probably is a need for some personnel file storage in an hr um administrator's office that would not be commingled with the general filing of the library um so i actually I, I think the limited times that you would need an additional chair, there's probably a solution <laughs> um, right. versus foregoing a filing option. Good call. Good call. Yeah, you, and you don't want to be too crowded in there at all times. Like, I would rather have the walking around space and not feel like <laughs> everything's like right here, too, if it's all these things added in. So, yeah, yeah I would. I would say so that would be so that would leave us with our current list then just the task chair and the armchair no we'd need to add filing we would need to add file there's one small file drawer unit that goes under the desk that's mm -hmm. that mobile file okay but if we wanted that's more like a, a box box file so like a pencil drawer a miscellaneous drawer and then a, and then a file you know a red not like a legal like a legal filing correct not like a you know the full unit width or depth for 60. So what would that add? What would that add in then? Like another three, four hundred dollars? I would think so, yeah. So would that bring that up to like twenty two hundred? Yes. Okay. Procedurally, Megan, um do we want to say twenty five just in case so that we don't have to come back if the filing cabinet costs four twenty eight, you know? We could do that. There's also the variable of the installation. If we're doing this along with a few other last um, furniture items, then that installation cost gets sort of distributed around. If we're ordering this separately, there's going to be a distinct installation cost for this as well. And what could that possibly, like how much would that possibly add in? It's usually about, depending on what the pieces are, because they always get set as a range by the New York state contract for things like this, it's usually between eight and 12%. You know, if if accent furniture who does the installation knows they're going to do a number of, you know, a full day's worth of installations, their rate usually goes down or if it's easy things like chairs, the rate is lower um, than if it's, you know, so would the, tw the 2500 cover that then with that. I would think so, because I think we'll probably do those other pieces as well that need to be added. Like a, um, the circulation desk had asked for some storage underneath the desk. So, you know, we could do that purchase altogether. Okay, so we're looking at 2,500 with the original list we had, plus, plus an additional file. larger filing cabinet for personnel files, so it's kept in the office, and then um, potentially an install fee, which we'll find out later. Okay, does anybody have any additional questions? Do we? I'm in support. Okay, do we throw it to a vote for something like that? Informally, yeah. Technically, okay. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Megan, just to re just to refresh, because it's been a while, isn't it the case that now Elish, as chair of this committee, combined with me, can make an affirmative vote because it's under ten thousand? Yeah. So, if you don't mind doing it that way, I mean, otherwise we can ask uh, Vanessa or Tony. I know Ven Vanessa already said she was in support. Either way works. So. I'm in support if that's the way we're doing it. I think it was not to criticize him. It was um, the committee chair and yourself. If we weren't in a committee meeting. Oh, you're right. Right. Yeah, something that's that right. Had some urgency or just could be addressed and resolved promptly. We had just the 2 approvers, but if we could do it at a committee meeting, we were doing it at the committee level. Yeah, yeah, yeah we can throw it out there. So I have Vanessa. Yes. I mean, yes. Uh, Tony, where are you yes. at? Yep, yeah. Okay. Perfect, perfect. And that's pretty much it. I'll note Tim on here that you were in favor, <laughs> but I think you don't count at the moment. <laughs> um, okay. 
There we go. Easy breezy. We knocked one thing out. Um, can, I, can I throw, sorry, just, yeah. we can do some carpeting in there. We can take some of the overstock carpeting and lay it in there. So it would just be probably a few hundred dollars work for the laborer to come in and put down the adhesive and put the carpet tile down over the existing VCT so that there's no tear up. It would just be loaded over, which is a completely acceptable installation that we do oftentimes. We have enough extra carpet to cover. You do for that small of a space. Yeah. Okay. Hey Megan, question though. You know where the um the built-in wall furniture was taken out of that room. So I think there are two different levels of the floor. I can run down and check it, but I think the laminate tile might need to be removed to level them. We can have the flooring company maybe fill something in there rather than oh, okay. take bringing out a machine to scrape off those okay. tiles that do exist. I think they could fill it easier okay. so they can take it off and it'll be less disruptive to staff. Yeah. Okay. At lower expense. And the other thing that we had talked about and I think we resolved was you were going to swap out the door to that space with one from the yep. west room. The Sorry. room by the uh, so sorter machine. It. So yeah, that we just so that there could be a window there. Yeah. All right. So we're not going to do a borrowed light window in the wall. Well, we could do a borrowed light window in the wall. We, uh, we, meaning Natalie and I think it's a good idea. Um, you know, it's, uh, there's not any natural light in that spot, but if you put the borrowed light window in the wall, you'd catch some of the light coming in from the staff lounge. Wouldn't you? So what is this? This is for the office. Yeah, the, yeah. It's about ways to just make that space a little bit nicer. Like if we put in a. A window in the wall, even though it doesn't go directly to the outside, or at least give sort of the sense of having a little space outside of the eight by ten box that it is. Yeah. And do you have an idea of what putting a window in would cost? I haven't got Ed, the numbers back officially, but I was thinking it was probably two to three thousand dollars by the time it was done, cleaned up, and painted and such. Well, I'm in favor of it, but it's a lot of money for a window, you know. Yeah. And it's something you could still do later if it, it's required. It also, I'm assuming, would need a window covering then just for yeah. privacy. So it feels like a whole thing. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, I was also saying it should have, when I sent it to the contractor to price, I said it should be a, a skinny rectangular window so it would have a sill height of 48 inches so it wouldn't be like a normal window sill that you know you can see in like at, at your house but um so it would have sort of like give the effect of having some light in there but without having a quick viewing angle of somebody walking by and looking at the monitor screens okay. yeah actually maybe that's the smartest thing yet is the maybe the window in the door is enough for the person because otherwise you could mm -hmm. theoretically stand there and read what's on his or her computer, you know? Yeah. Um, so Barbara had her hand up and then Tim after that. I just had a quick question uh, because I had trouble getting into the meeting. Where is the scheduled uh, conference room for this individual? We haven't um, designated a scheduled conference room, but they could use the Tawasentha or one of our study rooms? You mean when they want to meet with somebody? No, 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 I meant their office space. Where are you carving oh. out their office so, space? So it's a room that we used to call the shredder room in the back hallway. Uh, it's right next to the maintenance department. It's between the maintenance department and, um, the and uh, one of the staff restrooms. Tim? R? Yeah. R? <laughs> to the we got Tim one and Tim two, I guess. Tim two. We can't hear you. I don't know if it's in the phone. Is there a chat? I don't know if uh, chat on here. Tim, can you type in the chat? Or you can text me, Tim, if you want. Well, I think or you can call. call in from your phone. Like if your audio is not working on your computer, usually there's like a phone, like a call in option that should be on the. You could also call me, Tim, and I'll put you on speaker. Hopefully you can hear us. I guess I'll type. 
in the chat too. I'm assuming he can hear us because he raised his hand, right? So. All right, I guess we'll... Oh, he left. <laughs> Maybe he's gonna try to call in. Yeah. I mean, I've had to do that before where I'm like on the video on my computer and then calling in from my phone, so. It is possible. Uh, I guess while we're waiting on him, we can move on to the, oh, let's see. Tim, you're back. Can you hear you? Hello, hello. I don't know if you can hear me. We cannot hear you. You might need to call in on the phone number. If you don't want to fiddle around with your audio settings. Um, do you want to try to call in on your cell phone, Tim? All right, he said yes. So I guess we, I'll call in a sec. Um, so whatever he has to say may be related. To the window? To, you, to your vote, um, but uh, we could go on to the other matter uh, of the adjustments to the cafe in the interest of time. Yeah, and I think that might be short because I think we were going to try to give just approve like a budget range since I know we're um, we're just getting kind of some specs put together. I know uh, Mel went in and like kind of like hand drew up some like specs and we don't know what the pricing will be just yet. So I was thinking maybe it might in the interest of time but be better to work backwards and be like, what is our total budget? And then, you know make do with that and then obviously in a year's time if things go well we can always like add an extra stuff i think mel you said you were kind of on the same page with that maybe right yeah would it so would it make sense for megan to tell us any firm prices she has for stuff we've already determined i can do that if you're up for it yeah for sure um i do have a or two numbers, a best case and a worst case value for doing the two 220 volt circuits at the back counter. Um, in the best case scenario, if there's space in the panels in the adjacent um, storage room off the Helderberg room, it would be $3,500 to run those two new circuits. Um, and it's the worst case if they have to go back to a different panel on the other side of the lobby and restrooms, it would be $6,000. Thirty-three hundred and then six thousand. Thirty-five. And what is it? What, what, what is it for? What do we need it for to operate? The two twenties would operate the coffee machines that would be needed in the espresso machine. Pretty essential to a cafe. Got it. Yes. So that is just for one the one item. <laughs> um. Okay, what was the other one that you had numbers for? Um, I put some ranges on the other items because these contractors are supposed to get back to me by the end of this week or Monday of next mm -hmm. week at the latest, knowing your board was meeting on Thursday. Um, right. For the built-in counter under the window that faces out towards Western Ave, um, yep. I gave that a budget of 1500 to $2,500. And Megan, did that include a two or three under shelf or uh, under counter shelving units or not? We didn't talk about what those would look like in terms of how deep or what they would hold. So I didn't mm -hmm. put that in. Okay. And Tim, I, I have actually another like design idea that I'd like to bring forward because when discussing it with um, my partners, they were more concerned about people not being able to have access to any of the books that are near the folks that will be sitting there possibly you know not only that but, 
when I was talking about it with a colleague today, it was like, well, if you had room for one person to stick their legs under the counter, that's great, but people want to congregate. So right. maybe putting bookshelves under there was a fun idea, but one we should just, you know. Well, uh, they can kick them too and possibly damage them, right? As right. Well. Right. So um, my thought process with Jonathan when we went um, yesterday morning to do some measurements was to um, take the backside uh, corner. So to if you're facing the windows to the right, that kind of like L shape wall that you have there, just turning that whole corner into like some built in shelves. And then on the opposite side, as a part of my furnishings, I'd like to do um, some more bookshelves that kind of have like a cool, unique, wavy design of some sort um, to bring some cool pattern. It'll help with the overall look and feel of the cafe, but also present more book space to put used books on. So. So you're, you're drawing that up in a way and then asking Megan to price it out. Yeah, so I have like very rough drawings because it was just kind of I was like. I going to ask Megan, do of... you have the floor plan for the cafe that you can show us just as a reference? Or give me one second. And then, um, Mel, if you could just back up a little, I, I feel like I'm missing some context. And so um, okay. I'm happy to talk through the individual items, but could you talk a little bit about like the sort of the the why or the the motivation for some of these these changes i obviously understand the outlets for the the coffee machines what was the thinking about the additional counter was it just because there wasn't enough seating space could you just i i just don't i feel like i'm coming in at the end of a conversation and don't have all of the context sure yeah, no problem we, yeah go ahead. go ahead we pretty okay. much have a new committee so yeah that's a great question that's fine. Um, so basically to maximize seating space uh, for the guests that would be coming in, um, we discussed putting a counter in front of the windows um, for like singular seating or for maybe a couple that would like to come and sit down and hang out. Um, we certainly would have tables and chairs uh, available towards like the center of the room, um, but just to maximize the seating space there for uh guests that come in and you know they do have access to the entire library but if we can encourage some of the other meals that may be a little messy for the library such as like soups and and things um then you know there's maximal seating in there for them to be able to enjoy the space and also kind of taking advantage of the four windows and looking out towards yeah. western avenue sure and so currently the 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 space would accommodate how many for seating and this counter would increase it by how much? I actually don't have um, the size of the room per se. And with any other fixtures um, that, you know, we decide to put in with Megan, then it, it that'll kind of take away from the seating space. So until I have a full on uh, inspection uh, with the furniture and like fixtures that are there, I won't really know how many I can seat in there. But I would imagine I'm, I'm hoping to have at least 20 seats. Megan, so the original with the, with the space, sorry, Tom. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just about to pull it up. I couldn't find the right file that had more space around it. So Vanessa, I think um, sort of the tug of war is seating space plus bookshelf space because the thought mm -hmm. was to sell books in the cafe. And so it's trying to maximize having the ability for bookshelves to sell used right. books, which is something that had been happening before. So returning to that, but then also making sure that there's actually enough like accessible seating space for people to hang out. Oh, yay. Sorry, I can turn off the dimensions. So yeah, Megan, I guess, do you want to explain sort of I'm not, I'm definitely not a blueprint expert, but if you want to kind of walk through generally what we're looking at. Well, what we're looking at is, um, this is a cropped down view, so I apologize if it's unusual to look at. Um, this is the main entrance to the library. So this is that vestibule with the sliding doors and there's the door on your right as you come in, that new door into the meeting room, what was a meeting room, that's now the cafe space. Um, these are the windows that we were just discussing that face Western Ave. This was um, an earlier version of the, the counter. Um, 
if I wanted to do something with dimensions, I opened. A, I wanted to open a file that I could use the dimension tool on. Um, this is that door out to the plaza space. This is the door to the uh, the existing door out into the lobby space. Uh, so we've got the back counter that has the sink, the work counter. I, this one's pushed further out, and then some tables and chairs and. We've got some clearance that we could do the counter along the windows. Okay. And I believe Mel was talking about doing. Yeah. So right in that corner that Megan has the arrow in, I was thinking of doing some built in bookshelves that um, we can essentially do as high as possible. I would like a some, somewhat floor to ceiling, but um, you know, being able to put books along that side and then on the opposite wall, um, near, like in front of the tables. Yep. Right there. Uh, I was thinking of putting the the more uh, whimsical looking bookshelf on that wall there. So if I'm looking at this right, this is seating for about 16 with the counter on the window potentially adding what another four to six? I would say four Probably. to six. Yeah. Six? Four, four to six. Yeah. Okay. Is that just storage in the bottom right hand side there? The other door? Yes. Yes, that's a closet that's in there. Okay. So, um, so that's good just for a visual. Cause I think I've only seen the room with like a bunch of stuff in it. So like, I don't, have yeah. Kind of concept, like. And I should be able to fit to, um, to couple high tops on uh, that far wall as well. Um, next to the closet there. And is this with the counter where it's at now, or is this with the, the thought of moving it out a little bit for that, this is the moved out location moved out okay. the moved out location okay so that's sort of a worst case for looking at floor spaces right there. and in terms of pricing because i know that's probably the most important and also kind of dictates where we're going with this space how much would it cost to move it out because right now we have it pushed in a little bit where there's not a lot of clearance um and i think we had some concerns about um one what sort of oh there we go okay well and there you go i was so, estimating about twenty five hundred to four thousand dollars because there'll be some floor repair work we certainly don't want to create a trip hazard um back behind the counter mm -hmm. when we have to place a few tiles and such but it i think it's closer to twenty five hundred but okay wanted to be and, conservative and that most of that cost is the floor repair no, just I wanted to point out that there is floor repair in there that I already thought of and included in that number. So what um, what goes into that cost? That seems high uh, to me, not knowing anything, but like the counter is already there. So this right. is including the cost of the counter or just moving the counter? Um, moving it, I was thinking, I, I'm just trying to be really conservative with any number. Ideally, this is a quick four hour move for two guys to move. Um, but I didn't know if anything in their move got lost or damaged because it wasn't intended to be um, taken out and adjusted in location. So I don't know if they need to replace like the bottom two by four framing piece that they screwed through or how they connected it to the floor exactly. Um, but also keep in mind that any cost may seem higher than you might expect because everything has to be done with prevailing wage rates. So those the labor rates become probably twice as much as you would anticipate them being. All right. I'm put conservative numbers on these things until Monday when I have everything in hand. So Monday we'll have like a more accurate price. Yes. Okay. With with the exception of what Mel wants in terms of like storage, which I haven't seen yet to then feed to a contractor. Okay. So I Again, would it make more sense to just start with a, a budget? I don't know, Tim, when this all started, um, if there was any discussion with the previous committee or at any level, um, what sort of budget a potential vendor would have to work with. Do we have any frame of reference for that? Let me kind of take a step back there and and uh, Megan can correct me if I get anything wrong, but um, the concept uh, at the very beginning of the construction project was essentially to not do anything uh, yet in the Norman Skill Room because once we found a potential vendor, they would be able to, you know, help us decide uh, what it should look like uh, because you know it's um, it's obviously like we care what it looks like, but 
we feel that any vendor would want to design it to, you know, optimize efficiency and, you know, basically profit potential for the vendor. Um, so the previous committee took the point of view of let's just wait. And then we issued the RFP for vendors and we didn't get any. So we kept uh, just waiting. And then we decided to put that counter in as a committee in order to make the space look a little bit more like a cafe uh, and make it therefore more attractive to uh, vendors because we thought we were going to issue the RFP again. And then, uh, so we put that in and then like just a week or two later, Elish brought um, Melanie and Joy uh, connected us. And um, so, you know, technically speaking, if um, if we had put that counter in a couple of weeks later, we probably wouldn't have to move it because they would have showed us where where they would like to have it. Um, but at any rate, there's always been a concept that it was going to take more library money to finish this space uh, to make it attractive to a vendor. But we've never known how much there was. There were questions about did do we need to buy the restaurant equipment or not, and so. Like way back in time, you know, there was one school of thought that said, buy everything, design a complete cafe restaurant, and then we'll just look for a turnkey vendor. And Megan then pointed out, and I think wisely, that what if you don't get one? Then you've got a cafe and you can't do anything with it. So, you know, that's kind of the history. Um, Megan, does that, uh, do you have anything to add or subtract from that? Oh, that looks pretty. My other concern was in fitting out an entire space would be that a vendor might come in and say, well, I didn't like, I don't like that dishwasher. I want this type of dishwasher. And then the library is constantly paying to replace equipment that really isn't even within the library wheelhouse of um, public service in that regard. Not within the mission, yeah. Mm -hmm. our, our, my thought was keep it as much of a shell as possible. And then the vendor or the tenant can come in and put in what they need and that way they can take it back out again and the next tenant that comes in can make it their space without the library repeatedly spending money on the space. Right. Okay. So there was no real like ballpark number we were working with, but do we have like, um, when we approve the budget, like do we have, is there like a financial line item that we pulled from for this kind of thing that we know whether or not we have that room or not? Um, we're in terms of our overall budget and known expenditures, we've done and completed them and we've remained under budget. So we've, uh, um, you know, taken from some of that excess because we haven't finalized, um, the referendum amount, or not the referendum, I'm sorry, the bond amount. So there's still some money to work with for building improvements. So that's what we've been working on when we need to do some additional things. Do we know what's left over currently? Um, do, but I, I believe it's about $400,000, but I don't have that. M Megan, is there a specific cafe like line though in the project budget? And there was not it have remaining funds in it. We did not have a cafe line item. We, the only thing we had planned in the original budget was for the millwork for the counters to go in. And that was all. Okay. Megan, I have a question for you. Yes, ma'am. Um, have you decided whether or not we can put that door back in into the kitchenette? I know you I had a concern about plumbing or something being in the wall. I'm sure we can get it back in. It might not go exactly in that same spot, but we should be able to find a way to put it in. Now, Megan, um, when John and I were like doing measurements and stuff yesterday, we had discussed um, because uh, I believe one of the maintenance men, David, was there, and he said that on that left side where you guys uh, took the door out, that there there should be plumbing there, which you and I had discussed. So I think on the right side, I don't know what's on that side, but we were thinking of possibly a, a like just a standard 36 by 80 um, walkway into there, which I believe in the Heldeberg side, that's where the refrigerator is. Mm -hmm. Which could be shifted over. So I think it's just at this, I, I assume it's just power that's on that side. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so would it put in, oh, sorry. So Barbara's question brings up um, what for me and Natalie uh, is kind of an elephant in the room. Um, 
we were meeting with our department heads today and particularly with the two departments, um, two department heads who uh, do programming, uh, Beth Rienti from youth and Maria Buell from adult. Um, and uh, in short, uh, they've got some concerns about um, sharing that kitchen space. And as much as we have reassured them that in our many meetings with Joy and Melanie, um, it doesn't seem to be any kind of a problem to occasionally uh, share the space. Uh, for example, let's say on staff development day when we might be using that um, in a traditional arrangement, we might be using that um, kitchen relatively extensively. Um, you know, I, I, I'm uh, going to invite Natalie to jump in too if she wishes, but um, I think the way to get over that problem is to get a meeting together with um, Melanie and with the department heads, which is something I tried to do maybe three weeks ago, yeah. but then the two department heads in question both had that particular day off. So, and then <laughs> Melanie had a reason that she needed to, um, uh, she was going to serve lunch to the department heads and it fell through. We would like to do it again, but I'm kind of wondering yeah. if um, uh, I read in the paper today that the Gilded Age films through August 26th. So uh, I haven't asked you this yet, um, Melanie, but I'm kind of wondering if, you know, you would need to do that after the 26th rather than trying to squeeze that in prior to that time. So, so they've actually only started filming um, in Albany, and I believe their next location is going to be Troy. They're still in the building stages in Cohoes. So we're just on standby for all of their um, set catering needs until the sets are actually prepared and ready to go for filming. Um, so th that could be six to eight weeks worth of filming, and it may not even start till the end of the month or by September. We're not too sure yet. Um, most of the folks are moving up from New York City, so we're pretty much just waiting on them to get settled and then get us a schedule. So at this point, um, whatever I have pre-booked during that time uh, is my first priority. Yeah. Okay. So I'll talk to you offline about doing a sure. lunch. Uh, but the um, uh, and I'm you know I'm fascinated by what we're talking about so far, but I'm trying to take my mind back into this meeting this afternoon. And I know we're going to run short on time, um, but basically the question comes down to, um, do we want to go with what um, Megan Brennan has talked about as kind of an option A or an option B? And to kind of give a quick um, uh, introduction to that for board members, particularly anyone who's new on the committee, when the committee or when the cafe was envisioned uh, prior to the building project, it was basically envisioned as kind of a grab and go operation. And in essence, that's why you saw, if you've been in the room, the counter that Megan built, because there's just enough space in there for maybe two employees to be involved in handing out pre-made food, you know, paying for it and so forth. We were surprised, stunned and pleased when a vendor like uh, Cafe Con Mel came and wanted to do a full scale restaurant, you know, full scale, like a larger vision than what we had. So in shorthand, we've been calling it snack bar, which was like version A. That's what we were all thinking about prior to the um, to Melanie and uh, Joy showing up or cafe, which is option B. And basically it just allows them to do a more expanded menu. Um, Still all the cooking done at their catering kitchen in Cohoes, but more space to walk around behind the counter. And I think if I remember correctly, Melanie, quite key for you guys to have access to the additional space of the, the kitchen that's in the Helderberg room. And that's why we're talking about putting a door in. But um, so, you know, sorry to put words in your mouth, Melanie, but the last time we were speaking, she was like, Hey, if the if the board wants a snack bar option, we'll do that. We'll see how it goes, and and maybe we could expand it later. Um, and if the board wants to go sort of whole hog with the cafe, that would be great too. The problem comes in because uh, the programming librarians see lots of different cases. For example, they run a monthly or had used to run prior to COVID a monthly cookbook club where they invite the author of a cookbook to come in and cook. And I've said to them today when we were talking about it, Melanie has assured me that she would be uh, hospitable to such an approach. Um, but 
I I don't think they can wrap uh, they can accept that idea because they're like you're operating a restaurant at the same time that we're operating a program in the same space. It's just not going to work, you know. Um, which also Megan had advised us earlier on. So um, you know we've got to somehow get that th those people together with you melanie so we can talk that through sure and tim if i can just like touch real quick on that on s something of that nature um those are things that i'm happy to come in and help facilitate in a, in an easier way and and a more efficient way you know if it's if it's a program that needs to happen during the time that the cafe is open i have all sorts of portable equipment that we can put in the helderberg room and create essentially like a culinary class style, you know, have it class style for them to be able to sit and actually watch the author of the cookbook cook a meal in front mm -hmm. of them. Um, so, you know, there's ways that we can work around things like that. And if it's just as simple as them using the kitchen during off hours, even fine, no problem. Um, but I do understand the concern of having to do it at the exact same time. Yes, it may pose a difficulty, especially if we're super, super busy in the cafe that day and we're trying to work around each other in a small kitchen. Um, but it's not impossible to to help with those accommodations to make programs like that more successful in the future. Right. And I think if we can get you together with those folks, um, particularly over food, um, <laughs> uh, that, you know, we can all begin to share a vision. But it, it still remains that the board has to decide whether they want to put that door in now or whether they and and have a larger scale restaurant or um you know go with more the um uh you know uh, snack bar option uh, a little bit scaled back menu and so forth and see how it goes and then potentially expand the operation later which um now i'm putting words in megan's mouth but that would likely be, as I understand it, after you know our official relationship with Butler, Roland, and Mays has closed out. But my understanding is that Megan would be available down the road if we wanted to explore that. You know, it would just be a new contract with Butler, Roland, and Mays um, in order to get a job like that done. Is that correct, Megan? You're muted. Sorry. No, you're fine. He didn't need to hear the six year old a minute ago. Um, <laughs> it's true. I mean, we're always happy to help. And if it's something even small, we don't even need a full contract. We might just have a quick, you know, hourly services thing that we can help you with. But a lot I mean, of this it would cost to put that door back in. So I threw a number at it because, again, I was waiting for these contractors to get back to me this summer. Um, new door, I was saying three to five thousand dollars just by the time they do the hardware um if it's a door if it's just an open opening a passageway that's finished it's obviously a lot less it's probably more like fifteen hundred dollars but if it's a door there's there's more expense to it there's the hollow metal frame right the door, the opening um, so i was thinking of just like an opening with like maybe saloon door styles you know just just something that just just a walkway through just your standard walkway should be just fine there because um, if you consider like opening the door on either side, there's still not a whole lot of space in there in the Hildebrand kitchen. Um, and then vice versa, if you pull it outwards, the mm -hmm. the other, you the know, with the counter and everything, yeah. Bar Would it need it to be an actual door if Jurgen no. the library is going to be able to retain use of the kitchen when the cafe is closed? That's when you would probably want a full door. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't you want it to lock? I yeah, would so. essentially, if that was an issue, but I mean, we could always have someone on site as well to help out with anything, you know, if that if that becomes a issue, if it needs to be used. The Barbara, other do you have a question. I I just wanted to make a comment that I I think if we're going to do, we should do the door. I mean, what Mel has proposed is, you know, quite extraordinary, and they're willing to to make it into a cafe, which I think was the original idea. So while we have the bond money uh, to, to do the renovations, I think we should do them and, um, you know, give them a chance at, at actually being successful. Um, the, the meals and the sandwiches and things that she has proposed, you know, are very unique. And, 
just to limit it to, you know, some takeout sandwiches, uh, I think really takes away from what they're trying to do. So, and it would be a terrible inconvenience not to be able to use the kitchen behind them and have to go out into the room and then come in through the other door. Uh, so I would say, you know, put in the door. Um, I don't know about a pocket door. Is there a thing such as a pocket door that, or maybe you can't lock those, I'm not sure. Because it's an existing wall, we couldn't do a pocket door. Okay. Because they need, it's actually a double framed wall that the pocket door slides in between. Yeah, okay. But, but that's right. a good idea, sorry. Just yeah. a wet blanket sometimes. <laughs> so I would say at this point, just to tie off the, um, the improvement part so that we can go to the contract is just, since we have this like, technically like a bucket to pull from can we give like a ballpark estimate of what pie in the sky everything would cost and that would be that that fund we would pull from because it doesn't sound like this is going to go over what 30 40 with everything if we did literally everything worst case scenario price right I did some quick math, but I'm not like a mathematician. What's our limit as a committee? Because I think we are we approaching just something where we'd be making a recommendation to the full board to vote on. Oh, I think we're past it because I think it was ten thousand. Yeah. So we'd be making a recommendation, right. but it okay. looks like we technically have a budget we could pull from, and then so it's all this plus the door, right? And then right. plus potential cabinetry or storage or whatever, which we don't know the amount, right? So I have one comment and one question. Um, um, I do tend uh, to agree that I would prefer to see us include okay. cafe improvements within this construction project um, and to do and to, to do what we need and open up a door to the kitchenette. Um, I would want to make sure I would be um, in favor of doing it in a way um, that allows us, um, like what's so great about this initial relationship is that it's very congenial <laughs> and cooperative, um, but I wanna make sure that we um, have a door that could lock um, just so in the future, way down the line when Mel is super successful and moves on beyond us. Um, if we were to have a lesser uh, vendor involved, that we have a setup that could um, accommodate a, a different relationship. You know, yeah. not everybody is as generous as she is, and so I want to make sure that you know why we have the funds. We're we're just making decisions in that light. Um, so then that's my comment. My question is about the cabinets um, at the wall. When we say cabinets, are we talking bookshelves or are they closed? Um, no. And is this something, is there something that has shifted in use that we've already purchased that we could reuse in this space? I vaguely remember seeing a ton of bookcases somewhere that weren't being used. And so I'm just, I'm, I guess I'm asking if, the, if we've exhausted any sort of other furniture um, that could be repurposed. I think earlier you mentioned s some built-ins that have been taken out of the room we're not gonna use as an office. Can something like that be repurposed? Um, I'm just hopeful that maybe we can be resourceful um, and find use of something we might already have for some of this. I was anticipating, but I hadn't heard from Mel, but she would want closed cabinets for ingredient storage or just miscellaneous, you know, packaging cups, lids and such. Um, but sure. Um, oh, so the I'm closet, I thought it was the cabinets for the L shaped wall. So maybe I'm. Oh, the, the L shaped wall. We just briefly touched that um, we would have some bookcases there and it, and certainly if there's stuff that can be repurposed. I, I don't know, Megan, chime in if this is okay or not, but um, you know, I'm, I'm fine with repurposing things there. I mean, it, I've done it in the other cafes and I wouldn't mind carrying that forward too in this cafe. Um, it's kind of my signature to take things that are either donated or just uh, they have the ability to be repurposed and use them. Um, so I like the idea of being able to do so, uh, especially if there's built-ins or like floor to ceiling built-ins that are not being utilized elsewhere. Um, so I, I'm certainly okay with it. The bookcases that are currently in there, we discussed putting three of them 
in the space originally. And um, Tim had came come back with uh, f others feeling that it wasn't enough selling space for the used books. So that's why I, I kind of am chiming in on, can we do something that's more floor to ceiling and maximize the selling space for the books? So there, um, as you may recall, um, Melanie, there are three of those kind of light pine uh, bookcases, mm -hmm. um, and I'm I'm not a carpenter, but I'm wondering uh, if we could take the three that exist for your L-shaped wall, put one on each side of the L, and then build the top shelves from the third one. Um, sure. It, you know, and I I'm thinking that uh, you have a contact who might be able to do that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So. and I'm sure he would be happy for me to add it onto his list. <laughs> so then to um, clarify, is the cabinetry an additional need beyond the selling space? I, I guess I'm confused there. There was some cabinetry that um, Megan and I had discussed possibly going over exactly what she's highlighting there, which is the back bar. And yeah. um, that was pending the decision of either putting a door or a passage window through to the Heldeberg kitchenette. Um, so, you know, those are things that, you know, if we decide to put the doorway in, then yeah, I could utilize a couple of cabinets, um, hanging cabinets up on that wall, uh, for some extra excess storage space. Um, and then of course I have the closet there as well. That could be for, um, any, any, uh, excess things that I need there. So, you know, shelving or possible closed cabinetry, uh, up above that counter would be ideal if we can put the door in, or if we decide to just make it a snack bar. But uh, we weren't sure if uh, if the open window, if a pass through window was going to be there, then obviously that would minimize the space for the possibility of cabinets. Mel, are you going to give me what you would like to see back there, ideally? With or without? Yeah, I have um, some like just kind of like hand drawn stuff that I can right. I can certainly uh, scan and just email over to you. Perfect. Okay. I think probably because one way or another, like either you're going to put in more cabinetry and a no door or a small window or whatever, where you're going to do mm -hmm. the door, less cabinetry. So it kind of like pulls one from the other. So mm -hmm. is it pretty safe if we make a recommendation and just say like, look, we already have this big pool to pull from. We're, we're thinking it's going to be about 40,000 and put that forward as our um, recommendation for the improvements. Does that sound? It okay. certainly works for me, Vanessa, because there's still some questions, you know, and I like putting the door in, but making it lockable because uh, of the example you used, Vanessa, that, you know, um, uh, Melanie's company may move on. But like in talking to Ike Pulver, the director of Saratoga, who's had four different cafe operators in 25 years, um, there could be like a two year period between operators. So then you want the maximum flexibility so you can use that room any way that you want. Um, you know, so to me, a door creates flexibility and a wall takes it away. Um, okay. But mm -hmm. the ability to lock the door also like, let's say, um, you know, they are closing every night at six as they plan and we're showing a movie at seven. If I were Mel, I'd want to lock that door um, because I know that the staff is going to be using a popcorn machine and pouring soda on the other side of it. And I don't really want them in my space that I've already cleaned. Um, you know, so I don't know. That's just that's just me talking, but I would put the door in. And I think the 40,000, like um, I would lean on or rely on um, Megan and Melanie to say whether that's not enough. But to me, uh, 40. Any any changes we could accomplish? I mean, I don't want to spend forty thousand if I can spend thirty thousand. But sure. I um, I think that that gives us enough flexibility to move forward. Um, and then as we evolve the concept with Melanie, um, you know, we would I presume come back to the group to say, okay, we decided on the door. Just want to make sure that's okay with you. Um, but other than that, um, I think that's a good way to go forward. Otherwise. The other option is to get everything nailed down completely before we have another meeting and say, here's exactly what it's going to cost and here's exactly the vision, you know. Sorry, my cat is jumping <laughs> on my computer. Um, yeah, that's why I was thinking working backwards might be like the most efficient thing, because if we just agree on a budget, then the rest are just incidentals. It's just like which door or which whatever. But if we get the financials locked down, the rest of the stuff will just come as as you guys are planning things out and i don't think 
does the board need to approve all that stuff or is that like not even at at that level like if you if you pick like um like a brown door over a blue door i don't is the board gonna care a whole lot at that point i don't hopefully not <laughs> that, so. you're you're you know commissioned as the committee to make those decisions and then just bring the, the yeah. completed package or the the scope back yeah so i think that's fine we think because we we added this up with our worst case scenario numbers so 40k was like the worst case scenario plus plus so there's a lot of padding in there so i think that'll be okay and plus this is not just specific to mel like this will be for all vendors to make use of so it'll put us in a good position where we're not constantly trying to catch up to what different vendors need we just do it right the first time and then it's not more expensive in the long run because you're constantly improving and changing things that were kind of done like you know whatever the first time around so i'm i'm a fan of just getting it done the right way and that being the most cost effective way so um as i am new to chairing is this a vote or is this like a i think you have we, to take a vote if that's to see if that's what the committee is recommending does that make cool. sense megan mm -hmm. okay so before we go to the vote does anybody have any lingering burning questions or anything like that if i'm being honest, I feel I'm, I have just, a, there's a little bit of pause in me. I know that we went with the like conservative high numbers, um, but 40 feels like a lot. <laughs> um, and I know we all agree that we would like to try to do it for less, um, but I don't know how, I mean, um, right. Yeah, and I, 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 thought at first too like some of those numbers were high and then i remember i just bought a house recently and trying to get anything done in my house is literally three times more than it used to be at the moment and i right. think megan said they have to go with like whatever prevailing wages numbers are for things so all materials labor all that kind of stuff is like through the roof right now because everything is super like scarce so i don't it's know what scarce. we could do cheaper yeah. without not doing things you know we would literally just be cutting things out at that point i don't know that there's necessarily is there a cheaper option or well if we don't do a door that has a hollow metal frame if we do more like what mel was saying like a, a passageway that has either like swinging doors or maybe she puts like a mm -hmm. curtain or something like that so that it's easy for her that doesn't take up floor space that reduces money um, when I add up that list of worst case scenarios, it comes to $24,500. Is it more palatable to say 30,000 or 25,000? And then we work from there. Work from there. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and just one little like detail, if I can just touch on it, um, because I know it's going to lead into the next portion of the meeting, which is the contract. Um, as a part of the contract, we discussed right to first refusal on all food and beverage needs for the property. So is it possible, Tim, that any of the um, staff members, you know, if there's even small needs such as popcorn or anything, is it possible that I, that, like, I would have right to first refusal on that or where does that line draw because i'm happy to do those things and of course if it's something like uh, a pizza night per se or, or if someone really really wants dunkin donuts for their program or meeting um i certainly would not sit there and be like well you have to go through me you know it's like no if if that if pizza is what you want and that's not really my thing by all means, please order all the pizza that you want but you know would they really need the kitchen at that point if i'm handling all those needs so um, I'm, I'm going to try to be quick, and here's what I'm going to suggest. You've hit on an important point that we were talking about earlier today, but I'm wondering if uh, Elish wouldn't mind getting the 25 or 30,000 vote out of the way. Sure. And then um, that right of first refusal is part of the contract that we do need to discuss, if that's okay with you as well. That's fine. I just I figured, you know, it, it, upon that discussion, that might steer one way or another. I mean, budget wise, by all means, take that vote. But, you know, with the doorway, would we need to have a locked doorway per se if the kitchenette is just absorbed into the cafe with just the walkthrough space? So that obviously would save on the budget. Right. It would, but it wouldn't. And I hate to okay. contradict. 
Oh, but I think no, we want to then change the lock set on the kitchenette door in the Helderberg yeah. room because right. you wouldn't want the ability for a staff or a library patron to go on help outside the kitchen or right with the, the other kitchen. entrance. Yeah. Which we had discussed when we were walking through, it was like, okay, at least that one would stay locked. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I think, you know, like we said, looking forward, you, you know, maybe the staff changes their mind or whatever it is down the road, we have that door there and offers right. that flexibility. So I'm going to say we go with 30,000, you know, I don't want to give us like absolutely no wiggle room. Um, because odds and ends come up and we don't know the price of that cabinetry and we don't know the 100% cost of the doors. Obviously, we'll know more Monday and hopefully it just falls under this stuff. And worse comes to worse, we figure out where we can like, you know, figure out what that wiggle room is. But um, are we good to take a vote on the 30,000 then? Um, yeah, I just, I guess I would just add that I, I think it would be important for this committee along with the sort of fund amount for cafe enhancements to include an actual recommendation, which I would be in favor of a door um, and and locks, right? So I just I just want to be clear on that. Like in the 30, um, I will I can support 30 if it includes um, a door. The doorway I think is the better option. Like I don't I don't want us to punt this down the road and we still haven't made a choice on what we're recommending, whether it's a pass through or a door. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping that we're saying 30,000 and recommending with a door, door with locks. I th yeah, I think we're all on the same page with the lock door is what it's sounding mm -hmm. like. Um, and then Megan, if you wouldn't mind terribly throwing that on your, your breakdown and sending me that um, sure. chart, all the pricing. So then that way, when we go to the board, people can see exactly what was factored in. And then I got. I'm, I would assume on Monday you would have more of an idea on the cabinetry numbers and um, yes, whatever else. Yeah. Okay. If you're okay so, with me waiting till Monday, I can put the the true numbers in rather than yeah. Monday, I, Monday I think it look a lot better. Fine. Yeah, Monday's perfectly fine. I'd rather have as accurate as can be because whenever mm -hmm. things come to the board vague, it always adds an extra like 45 minutes on <laughs> <laughs> board meeting. So um, yeah, because that'll be the 15th, and then the board meeting's on the 18th. So that works for me. So we're going to recommend a door of the lock, um, everything else that was on the list, plus the cabinetry needed behind uh, the counter along the wall with the sink. And then um, I think that was it. So I think there are bookcases on the L shape and the custom bookcase mm -hmm. is something that um, we, we don't really like respectfully uh, uh melanie's got it in her mind's eye but i don't think megan's seen it yet so we don't really know what that would cost right well i think you said we might be able to repurpose some of the bookshelves yeah, yeah. Might just be like adding in whatever we're missing i guess in that so i think i think we kind of roughly threw that number in there to get to this 32 so we have kind of that space to work with that okay so I am gonna throw it, throw it to the group. All right, Vanessa, what do we think? Yep. Yes. Tony. Yes. All right, and I'm a yes. So there we go. All right, and last but not least, um, and hopefully the contract's pretty quick. That really was. It's kind of boilerplate, but there are some points of discussion, and some things are gonna obviously go back to um, Mel meeting with the department heads and getting on the same page that, there. Um, I don't know the best way I could pull it up on my screen. Um, I'm pretty sure Maybe that know. makes sense. The, the uh, Melanie, if you're, if you're happy enough to wait on that, um, I could put a meeting together um, sure. and, and we could kind of hash that out there, but in the, in a nutshell, the right of first refusal, um, uh, the staff brought up some some really good reasons that we might not want to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, they basically, um, I think, I think a meeting will help. Um, there are two kinds of events that go on at the library. One is community group, uh, you know, rentals, for lack of a better term, they don't pay anything to use the space, but they community group reservations and the other is library programs. Um, so I think that with the group today, there was a stronger feeling that library programs might occasionally want to be doing uh, food themselves rather than necessarily food that um, 
uh, that the cafe provided. Mm -hmm. um, and we can elaborate on that, Melanie, you and I, and, okay. and the department heads. Um, and then there was a, you know, something that frankly, I didn't really agree with, but with the community groups, um, you know, uh, so let's say that um, the, uh, uh, you know, Pop Warner Football Club wants to come in and they want to have a meeting in the Westbrook room across the hall, and they'd like to have coffee and bagels. Um, the group today was like, well, they should be able to do that on their own because uh, that's the way it currently is. And my my position is, if you can get coffee and bagels uh, by stopping two different places on your way here, um, or if you can get coffee and bagels for roughly the same price just by across the hall, the room, <laughs> why wouldn't you take the ones that you know will be there when you walk in uh, on the door? So we can talk a little bit more about that and kind of what I was thinking, you know, as one possible compromise is that, you know, we, the, the, um, the contract talks about a mechanism to let Melanie and Joy know what events are coming up. So, like, for certain library programs, we could just say, hey, look, Melanie and uh, Joy, this is something that, you know, uh, we have a staff member who's from, uh, uh, you know, Uzbekistan, and uh, she's going to teach us about Uzbek cookies. And uh, so that's not something, you know, I don't think that Melanie and Joy have an expertise in. But right. as you mentioned earlier, you might want to help facilitate with portable equipment and that sort of thing, you know. Sure. So. And that would just be purely voluntary. You know, it's not, yeah. um, I don't have to help with every single thing. You know, it, it, mm -hmm. it, having the right to first refuse, it does not mean that I have complete control over every little thing that's happening food-wise. Right. You know, I'm not going to come in and say, hey, you have a lunch from home. You can't do that. <laughs> that's that's not what we're mm -hmm. we're. Um, yeah. Speaking of, but a right to first refusal on major catering contracts and things, you know, I, mm -hmm. I certainly don't expect you guys to go to Mazone or some other larger name to cater something on site when you have a catering company that's working with you. And essentially it's going to give you better pricing is in-house and you can treat it as an in-house catering company. Um, and that's kind of like what we're doing here with the contract. It's really forming a partnership with the library in all of your food and beverage needs. My right to first refusal is not only, you know, me coming in and handling all the big stuff, but if you want me to handle the little stuff, I can. But again, if you're going to have a pizza night, a popcorn or anything like that, if it's something that I don't normally accommodate, by all means, go order Domino's or, you know, order Brugger's or whatever it is that you want. But if something that I do, then, you know, why not come to us? We're, we're literally going to be across the hall and can give you better, if not the same exact pricing. Really, really fast. Um, Megan, you can sign off. I saw your question, but for some reason, like, can't get to the chat. Now I'm sharing my window. So you're good to go, Megan. And then okay. you yeah. send me that stuff on Monday. To I will. Awesome. Thanks, Megan. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Have a good Thanks. Night. Yep. Good night. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so it sounds like this first, the right of first refusal just needs to be ha hammered out with the department heads. Like I said, it's yeah. kind of a bummer they didn't get to meet Mel because I think there would be a lot less reservations. Um, right knowing that she's a reasonable human being. <laughs> That's not gonna, like nitpick over, you know, you want to go get, you know, Dunkin' Donuts, you know, she's not making donuts from scratch and going to bug out about it. So um, it's, a, it's a fair concern. Obviously people don't know what they don't know. And, and it's always good to kind of consider, you know, worst case scenarios, but I just, I don't. Um, so, Alish, just to, I have a question. So it's our objective tonight to, you know, have discussion on some of these points and yep. um, make a suggestion for a change so that we're actually voting on a contract at the next meeting? Yeah, the the hope is since this kind of like already has been ongoing for kind of a little bit of time and I know we were trying to get in somebody. Okay, so then on this point of, of first refusal, um, yep in that portion of the contract, can we adjust it to say, like, you know, catering, I mean, um, catering needs or, you know, major catering needs or something like that? Tim, do you think that that would alleviate some of the concerns? Because to me, you don't cater, like, popcorn for a movie. So to me, that doesn't imply Mel. <laughs> But as far as she's saying, she is still available, but it isn't a first refusal situation. So can yeah. there be like a cost threshold, like say anything under 50 bucks or something? I don't know. 
Like it might be a way sense? to handle it too. I think really the I like your suggestion, both of them, Alicia and Vanessa. But I think um, uh, unless uh, and Natalie, I I assume is still with us. She was in the same meeting with yeah. me today. I'm thinking more and more that if we can get these department heads together with uh, Melanie and Joy, um, we'll iron this stuff out in a way that we can then come up with some language to suggest to the lawyer to put in there, um, yeah, really for everyone's benefit. Like my department heads, these two people are in charge of all programming and they, like they used another example. They said, let's say we do a cupcake decorating workshop. Do we have to do that with Melanie or can we just do it? You know? <laughs> no, um, they can just do it. And that's something yeah, that, yeah. yeah, that's not, um, that doesn't really fall under a right to first refusal um, um, clause. So it's like, you know, those are things that you know, we don't have to iron on every single detail, but uh, if we need to put it in wording in there, you know, uh, any any food and beverage needs uh, over a hundred dollars needs to be right to first refusal to me, then that's more than fine. You know, I, I imagine again, pizza nights or anything like that. That's not something that I have to come down ironclad and be like, well, it's in my contract. No, that's not what we're doing here. Right. 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 And so I think we'll Tim, iron so that I, out. I and... guess I understand your your suggestion about discussion, but that doesn't allow us to endorse a um, no, just or recommend a, a contract from the committee then. Are yeah, you, I worry that, that that will delay stuff because right. We'll so, like, that's why I'm saying, like, if we can make some changes, I'm not saying it still can't be reviewed by the lawyer or there couldn't be amendments later. But I'd like to see us at least where we can tighten up some of the language. So, Mel, is it fair to put like under a hundred bucks? Like, yeah, uh, that basically anything over a hundred dollars would be um, right to first refusal. And Melanie, I know I brought, um, I heard there might be like a concern with like, um, like events that require like liquor and beer. She doesn't have a liquor license. So that is a moot point at the moment. Um, anyway, so she said that she does have contacts and she's happy to help with that. Um, but also it wouldn't go through her necessarily by default since that's not something that she holds at the moment. Correct. So on here, I would put Lick, uh, food and non alcoholic beverages in yes. terms of eating, right? Under yeah. 2B? Yeah. Okay. And then under 100 bucks mm -hmm. should be included. Yep. Um, so then there is a concern that's relatively major. It's the next one on the page uh, about the hours of operation. I believe I copied a leash um, and uh, Kathy Barber on this. The um, some of the board members thought that there might be an insurance liability issue, um, not so much in the cafe itself, but in the lobby and the restrooms. So if they open at 830 in the morning and we open at 930 in the morning, who's responsible for anybody who has a heart attack out there or who slips on the floor and so on and so forth. So we ran that by our insurance broker um, and uh, our custodial staff arrives at 730 in the morning and once he knew that he was fine uh, with with the 830 um, opening time. But I just want to mention it as something that uh, has been questioned in the past and might be questioned again when we finalize the contract and vote on it. Any thoughts on that? So it sounds like from a liability standpoint, they're covered anyway, or were we, I thought there was yeah. one, one thing in that thread where they said that there might need to be some uh, language in her insurance clause that covers those two areas just as backup, right? Yeah, I think so. That was a long, a lot of emails ago, but I can double check that. I'll make a note on my copy of the contract to um, zero in on that, um, you know, so, uh, so that all parties understand I guess who's liable, um, you know, uh, it, it's a big issue because like, I suppose you can get injured in the cafe uh, due to hot coffee or due to the error sure. of, of a vendor's employee. But I think we should probably clarify who who is responsible if somebody slips and breaks their leg, some customer or even some staff member of the right. um, 
I'll well, it doesn't even get even more complicated when the library is actually open since both use those spaces. I mean, I'm curious about the other library that you referenced um, that had a vendor and how they handled it. Um, mm -hmm. This actually seems like kind of a big issue because I'm also thinking about someone who takes coffee or food um, from the cafe into the library and. And does what? And then where you're drawing the lines on these things. So it doesn't yeah. seem limited to just the hours. It's sort yeah. of the co-location. What about yeah. Sundays during the summer when the library is closed and the the market, the farmers market's on? Is the cafe open then too? The cafe will be open at that time too. And that if that happens, uh, we would need to uh, put a maintenance employee on to alleviate this concern. And that's not something we've discussed yet, but it would be a union issue. Like it's currently a paid day off or excuse me, a day off. Um, so uh, like my personal position is I'm fine. Give the cafe operators the, the code to get in um, and the key to get in. And, you know, our custodian will come by, uh, you know, Monday morning and clean it, um, which is what we do for our own facility anyway. But that is a kink we need to work out because um, uh, the cafe would certainly, um, the cafe and the farmer's market would certainly have a great relationship in terms of providing twice as much reason for a person to visit the area. You know, they can. Um, Won't they the farmer's market farm. be done by the time they open? By but the time be on this next year. Summer. Yeah, yeah. By the time this year that they open, it would. But next year, it's a potential issue. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Uh, but we'll figure it out. You know, it's a good question, Tony. Yeah, from what it was looking like in that conversation, it looked like it was like a geographic area. It's just the shared space would be that. It, well, it looks like it's a combination of like the geography, but also like a time. Like, so they're responsible for slip and falls or whatever in that hallway in that bathroom for that one hour they're open that the library isn't and then after that it sounds like it's the library since that's mostly the library area not the cafe area and then what about the patio that should be included yeah is the patio um cafe is that, is that for the cafe or is that which generally? side are we talking about front or that back area Either I the guess. front, Either. I was I was speaking okay. about the front. That the front that one has comes the doorway. With the cafe. Out. I assumed that that would be under like my jurisdiction yeah. area, so that would fall under my insurance. Yeah, but I guess the question there, Mel, is uh, if you're closing at six, what happened? Does our insurance then take over at six when we're open till nine? You know, um, I kind of wonder if the if all liability. That isn't directly caused by an employee of the cafe is essentially the library's liability. I, I guess we need to figure this out, of course. So I'll I'll get back in touch with the um, insurance broker um, and try to figure that out. Um, Tim, but, are you uh, able to touch base with the other library that has a? Of course, yeah, yeah, yep. So that's a good suggestion. That's Saratoga, by the way. So I think on this issue, it's ours and it's space. Um, and I need to get back with our um, insurance guy. Is that a good summary of uh, uh, the insurance issue? Yeah. Okay. Uh, item three there, um, you know, the only reason there's nothing written in there uh, is that, you know, we could have written in a starting date several times, but we would have missed it. So basically the concept is, um, you know, whenever it starts 365 days later and, and obviously in advance, uh, we meet with each other and, and uh, decide if both parties want to go forward for, and, and I think Melanie, if I'm not mistaken, you and I have talked about if the first year goes well, we'd probably want to do a multi-year uh, after that, is that correct? correct? Yeah. So, so I'm not a lawyer or a contract person, but would it be appropriate to just have the wording say the term of this lease shall be one year beginning, you know, upon, you know, whatever joint signatures? Like, I, I, I guess I'm wondering why 
we have to put dates in there to keep modifying it? Can it be executed or referenced by sort of I think the it dates? Can. And, um, the, the dates you know, don't have to be carb coded. They can be written in when you decide. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that almost seems like a non-issue. We're basically saying like we're good with a one-year contract. Mm -hmm. Is my takeaway, right? And then we put in the date when we know it. Yep. Okay. Uh, so, um, as Elish knows, and maybe other um, board members, the next issue of the rent and the profit sharing is is really something we have to figure out because. Um, and sorry, Mel, this a lot of discussion today, and you're going to hear about it for the first time. But one of our board members has raised the idea that, um, and there is a clause, um, uh, item five here, right under uh, item four. Um, so uh, we need to find out whether um, having a for profit business operating, you know, essentially constantly at the library will jeopardize the library's not-for-profit status. So there's been a lot of emails going back and forth about that today. And um, at the moment, um, our lawyer has said, you know, that's that's really more of a state regulatory and financial question. So Tim Riley, our fiscal officer, has um, late in the afternoon started asking our um, audit firm to weigh in on that uh, subject. Um, you know, and uh, the... You know, people were like, well, what if the rent were lower or higher? Um, and what if the profit sharing were a donation as opposed to profit sharing? All creative ways of thinking. But our lawyer and this particular board member seem to be taking the position that we could jeopardize our not for profit status. So obviously, we have to research that a little more before we enter into a contract. Um, and then uh, Tim also raised the point. Uh, actually after he left work today, so after the work day, raised the point that, well, if we can collect $50 a month from the farmer's market operator, why doesn't that call into question the same issue? You know, it's, uh, he's a right. for-profit uh, business person. And, um, uh, and my answer when that email was at, uh, both Tim and our auditor asked that. So I wrote back and I said, well, um, and I hope, I don't mean to point any fingers here, but I said, when we approved a farmer's market contract, which was written by the lawyer who wrote this contract, that issue didn't come up. Um, so uh, the only possible distinction we can see, Tim Riley and I, is that they're outside and, and uh, Mel and Joy are inside. Uh, might be a distinction without a difference, I don't know. But, um, you know, I know this isn't the only cafe in a public building. Uh, there's hundreds of them. in. New York, so I think it it's a matter of finding the right person to answer the question. Does that make sense, Tim? Yes, that makes sense, Tim. Okay. Anything to add on that? No, just to, yeah. gotta wait for the experts to to weigh in. Yeah, and that's why I sent an email. Uh, I thought I sent it at about one o'clock, and then about four thirty, I realized I hadn't. Um, but um, that's why I sent an email saying I, I think it's unrealistic for us to finalize a contract tonight because of a point like that, you know. Um, yeah, but that sounds like that's one of those things where it's going to be a standard thing that it's not up to our discretion to change anyway. So it's literally just having the language in there. And I think um, what it sounds like is going to be the most reasonable thing that comes out of this, because I can't imagine them having that liability for the entire building it sounds like it'll just be the rented space, which just seems pretty standard for, you know, renting business space in any building, right? Right. Frankly, I don't understand why it couldn't be, well, you know. I think, the... Go ahead, Tim. I think when you, no, well, when you say renting a space in any building, well, most, most buildings are commercial property and not for profit. So we have to determine, you know, is it prorated by the square footage or not? And then we have to put in the contract that that the tenant is responsible for that that taxation, not the library. And so we we owe it to to Cafe Mel to to figure this out and and quantify that for them as they make their business decision. Yeah, and frankly, like uh, you know, Cafe Mel, based on previous discussions, has raised that very same point. It's like, 
there's a lot of land here and a lot of building here, and they're using a small portion of it, you know. So, um, it's, is that anything uh, that the committee needs to like agree or disagree on? I don't think it matters, right? We would just follow it with whatever the legality is, mm -hmm. That's right? Just, right? Yeah. So, there's nothing right. to recommend because I don't think we have a lot of purview over changing stuff that's like a law, right? Yeah. Uh, I only thought that we'd want I only thought that we'd want to quantify it in the contract or or at least say that they'd be responsible and then they can decline the contract when they see the number if it's too high. I don't I don't know. That's right. Semantic. I think um in terms of us like recommending the contract, we can just say whatever the legal language is gonna be is in there. Obviously Mel can turn it down if it's something she doesn't wanna commit to, which is fine, but in terms of getting it to the board to get it approved, I don't, I don't see a problem with saying like this is going to have the boiler, boilerplate legal legalese in there, because there's really nothing we can do about it. It's up to the vendor to take it or leave it, right? Because right. any vendor would have the same liability. Right. Right. So it's not not customized to Cafe Comel. Alicia, just before you move on, um, yeah. again late to the party. Um, the just I would be interested in hearing a little bit more about how the rent amount was determined um, and if that was a result of it being um, proposed as a um, I guess what are we calling it a profit share at this point whether or not it ends up being being donated where did where did we get the rent amount from so um, I think I can give the cliff notes version and then Tim, keep me honest if I leave something out, but basically we were going to do no rent and the lawyer was like, uh, you can't do that. Um, there's a problem with that. So we came up with this low number. Tim came up with a low number, a hundred bucks. Um, cause we were legally advised. You can't do zero. Um, and then the profit share was like imagine it's wildly successful like this additional funding would go into like related library programs or other community things none of this would be profit for the library per se but it would go into other additional robust programming like you know more cooking classes or you know things like that that may tie into the cafe or not necessarily but go to just more library programming and then the, I don't know where the amount breakdowns came from, but that, that was the thought behind that. So the hundred a month came from me and the amount breakdowns, uh, Mel and I were just, you know, kind of workshopping the concept and um, uh, for full disclosure, uh, based on the original business proposal, um, you know, if the cafe is as successful as she thinks it can be, uh, she might be able to do like a thousand or $1,200 a month in rent. But we didn't want to take that risk for both parties. So we thought, well, let's do uh, a scaled version instead. And then we just made those numbers up. So, um, but the whole thing is so interesting because, uh, you know, at, uh, according to our um, lawyer, it doesn't matter if the rent is $1 or $1,200. It makes us a landlord of a for profit company and may change our status. So that's the thing we really need to. We, Alicia and I both, I think, were hoping that there'd be some kind of threshold, like, hey, if our income is less than $50,000 a year on this, then maybe the state lets this sort of thing happen. Um, but that, according to our lawyer, is not the way that it works. So, so um, I also noticed just then related number nine utilities that we're responsible for them. Um, so to me, it would be reasonable if the rent was an amount that we were certain, and I have no idea what the utilities are at the library, would at least cover the additional um, utility um, costs by having a tenant. I'm not sure yeah. why, how yeah, we can justify us paying the utilities, additional utilities. Right, I was gonna ask the same. So, um... The initial thought was for simplicity's sake, because uh, we didn't want to install separate meters and so forth for electricity, water, um, and whatever else we're using in there. Um, but, and, and I'm not disagreeing with you at all, Vanessa or Tim, um, 
like maybe uh, getting a little creative, but maybe the rent could be the cost of utilities, um, but you'd still need a way to figure out what the cost of those utilities are. Um, so, and on a related note, the IT related uh, utilities, all parties agree that that needs to be provided by Cafe Con Mel from a yes. cybersecurity point of view. However, the customers in the cafe would still have access to the Y, uh, the Wi-Fi here in the library. Um, but the uh, the business operations would be done through a secure internet uh, connection that they will provide. So, um, and, and when I wrote discuss with IT. That was my gut feeling. I had not yet run it by either Melanie or Sean Silvernail from our IT department, but they both are like, yeah, that has to be separate. So, so uh, I don't think any of these issues are unsolvable, but I am have now stepped over the line to I don't think that we can recommend a, a contract for approval this week. It seems that there are too many um, outstanding questions that I wouldn't be comfortable um, endorsing um, any format. Um, I know that typically with the not for profit um, relationship or proximity or use of space within a for profit. Um, I know I remember vaguely that there was something like the library can't profit off of the, the business unduly um, and um, and then I remember that they have to to, to pay rent. <laughs> um, and so I, I don't remember all of the details though, but I vaguely remember there it being related to sort of the value of the space. So I don't know, personally at, at a minimum, I can't, I'm not comfortable with taxpayer dollars paying for the, the utilities and services for a for profit. Um, and so I get the simplicity part, but even, you know, National Grid has budget plans or something where you pay like a single amount versus a varying amount. So if we can do a little work to figure that out, um, you know, we've, we talked about one of the enhancements um, to the space being an additional um, electrical line. So we know at a minimum there there are additional electrical costs beyond sort of the the capital improvement part of it, but ongoing that would not have otherwise been there were it not for um, the business. So I just think it, it's our responsibility to do a little bit of number crunching there. Uh, it, it almost seems like if you take all three of these issues that we really need to find the expert in renting public space to a private entity, you know? Um, I agree. And uh, reaching out to our auditor is a start. Um, and Vanessa, I may be um, barking up the wrong tree, but uh, I'm I'm wondering on the UAlbany campus, you know, like I guess there are Starbucks in there and so forth. Um, do you know if there's a business official over there we could talk to that that understands those relationships? Um, I, let me ask at system administration um, because that's where I encountered the the conversation I was referencing, but I'm just not solid enough on it. But um, let me do some asking and, and get back to you. Thank you but, for- But all uh, of the campuses deal with that, so. Yeah, yeah. And they're not-for-profits, correct? Yes. Okay, yep. So that'll be another possible avenue of getting some expertise in, you know. Okay, so we are all right, going to do some research on what that utility burden is going to be, right? Right. Who's um, following up on that? Uh, well, um, basically, uh, we do need to research that, but to me, I think it's the, the overall, like, that's a subset of this larger issue. Like, how do you, how does a not-for-profit become a landlord, you know? Um, and that's what Vanessa you're looking into? Vanessa's looking into it through the U Albany and Tim Riley's looking into aspects of that through our um, audit firm. And I will reach out to the director at Saratoga, um, which is the other library that has a cafe. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean this respectfully, but we, 
one possible conclusion is we may be overthinking a lot of this stuff. And then again, probably not, but I just want to throw that out there. Um, and then um, there is another uh, another concern that um, some of you board members saw in an email from me today. And again, a new thing for you, Melanie, but um, we did have our insurance broker look at the insurance terms in here and he's added um, several subcategories. So I sent okay. those to um, our lawyer and asked her to put them into uh, the next draft of the contract. I can certainly share them with you, Mel, if you're uh, curious. And, um, yeah. you know, so let me make myself a note to do that, or, or I'll try to do it right now while we're speaking. Um, Thank you. Sure. Yeah. So. yeah, we'll run, we'll run through the rest of the highlighted stuff just to see if there's anything, any more action items. Obviously, it, you know, we're not going to be able to make a recommendation, but hopefully if we can get everything else squared away, then we can. You can know what all of our problems are, right? Yeah, know what they all are, get them hammered out, and maybe do something in between so we're not waiting all the way till October. Um, if we can come to a consensus and agree on what we're recommending. Um, so we already talked about utilities and services. Um, you know, Mel's going to cover the IT stuff. Uh, furnishings and fixtures are also being supplied by the tenant, um, other than the fixed the fixed equipment fixtures which are like the counter and things like that that can't be able to take it out um mm -hmm. i don't think i don't see much to discuss on there unless anybody has any questions it seems pretty straightforward um all right repairs alterations just like a standard you're renting an apartment any any alterations or repairs that are needed are um you know, on the on the tenant to to fix. It says tenant may decorate the lease premises with the consent of the landlord. Um, they, you know, anything that's permanent will stay um, on the premises, and everything else will be removed. All fixtures and equipment related to cafe must be removed at the end of the lease term, and any damage done will be repaired by the tenant. Landlord shall be responsible for the repair or replacement of major systems of the structure, electrical, plumbing, heating, cooling nature. So anything that's part of the larger building as a whole. Anybody have anything on that? Not me. Okay. Uh, from a liability standpoint, um, it looks like Tim's going to provide Mel with the, what the breakdown is, but what it sounded like um, this was less than what her coverage is anyway. Mel, I don't know if you want to talk about that really quick, but I think you were saying that. I need you quiet, please. Anyway. Um, yeah, I have I, my general liability coverage is always at a $2 million. So mm -hmm. I believe that this was less. I can't really see it up in here. So, yeah, this is requesting a million, and mine's always $2 million, So. Okay. So the email I just sent is not much of a concern. I don't think so, uh, Tim. From what I saw, the breakdown being, but obviously Mel can look it over and um, sure. point out if there's any problems there. But when I saw a million on here and I knew hers, hers was two, I was like, oh, okay, that's whatever. Um, two million general. Yeah, there's a general aggregate it says here, and then tenant damage legal liability is only three hundred thousand. So. Two two million is is the cap of anything that's being asked for in general liability, and that's what I have, so okay. that's not an issue at all. Cool. <laughs> all right. Anybody have anything on that? Mm -hmm. Again, there's hey Barb. You're not on mute. Oh. <laughs> Oh, for some reason it doesn't get me off there, but I think she heard you. Nope. Maybe not. Oh, there we go. Um, okay, so again, that's something that we have like a audit template or whatever we need for that. So that'll just be put in there when we have that. Uh, tenant access. We discussed a little bit, but I'll review it. Um, tenant will be provided key cards to access the library facility. Such access is limited to the area of the cafe, restrooms, uh, held over room, kitchen. Obviously, if we go that route, the tenant, its employees, vendor, or customers are not allowed in other areas of the library facility if they're not open. 
So looks like we got to add that language in. Um, uh, what is this? Failure to enforce not waiver. The failure of the landlord to insist upon a strict performance of any of the terms, conditions, and covenants herein shall not be deemed a waiver of any rights or remedies that the landlord may have and shall not be deemed a waiver of any subsequent breach or question mark default in the terms. Yeah, I so just think that was we a just typo. Need to change that word. Oh, okay. And that's pretty much it. Those were the main like points of contention. Did anybody um, who reviewed the, the contract have any additional questions that they wanted to talk about or get clarity on? I just want to assure Melanie that I would like to have her in the library. Uh, it may not seem that way, uh, but um, and you know, uh, sometimes people say, "Why does it take the library so long to get everything done?" And I'm like, "Well, I don't know. Maybe businesses have you know more resources at their disposal to figure these things out." But anyway, um, it's our first time, and uh, uh, hopefully, the issues that were raised about liability and rent don't also apply to the farmer's market, because if they do, um, then I've got twice as many potential problems. I think it'll be more okay than than what we worry about. You know, um, I'm not too concerned with, with going forward. You know, I'm happy to work with you guys on whatever comes forth, but, you know, I've been offered non-for-profit spaces before where we had zero rent and zero utilities because it was an amenity to the non-for-profit company that was given it to us, but this was pre-COVID and it was like a, a SUNY system thing. So again, I, you know, I'm no expert on where that falls, but just in past experience, that, that's what I've I've had before. So it was no surprise to me that that's what was offered initially. Um, but, you know, that's why in this being a little bit smaller than the, the companies that I was offered this to before, um, you know, I that's why I kind of countered and say said, well, maybe we can do some sort of a profit sharing, or if I have to list it as a donation, then that should at least offset some of the um, costs of utilities throughout the year, but also help us be a part of the community that we're in, which is a part of our entire being when it comes to all of our cafes. Um, you know, we we really prefer to be the people's cafe. It's 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 supposed to be a library amenity, and that's what I want. So. You know, I'm happy to work whatever way around that we have to in order to make this legally possible. Awesome. And I just wanted to echo what Tim said as well, Melanie. This these things are never easy, and I know we're just beginning um, relationship and yeah. getting to know each other. But I too would like to say that I'm very much excited about you. Um, you all coming to join us at the library and. Um, just want to exercise my fiduciary responsibility as a board member. So that's Agreed. really where the questions come from. Agreed. And again, as a community member, you know, my, I, I live in Voorheesville, but, you know, Gilderlin being a uh, kitty corner to me is it's just kind of like, you know, that's, I don't want to be unfair to uh, any, any of the community members that are worried about where their tax dollars are going. You know, this is certainly not a thing where the business wants to come in and take advantage. It's a matter of what's normally offered in uh, non-for-profit sectors and, and how do we go about doing that properly. I just want to make sure I don't push the library into a different kind of bracket or anything. So whatever we have to do to make that happen um, properly, I'm happy to work with. You know, growing pains, that's all it is. Yep, yep. I see that's a special a great... meeting in our future. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> the timeline yes. here is the math is not mathing. So, um... <laughs> By all means, please, everyone, welcome to come up to the cafe in, in Cohoes and hopefully a, an opening here in Albany real soon. Um, our second cafe is well underway. So, Do you want to say anything about where that is and so forth? Or um, Sure. Um, yep. The first first cafe, of course, originally started in Cohoes. It used to be my catering kitchen um, that I had changed over into the cafe due to the pandemic. And then uh, when my investors came during a uh, difficult shutdown time due to COVID debt, um, you know, I was, I was approached by someone who had a turnkey cafe in Albany. So it's going to be on quail street in Albany, which is not my first location, <laughs> preferred location, but, uh, with all the college students and stuff there, it was really just an offer that I couldn't pass up. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy that a lot of community members have come together and, and referred us to all these different locations that we can, 
acquire and, and make something happen and um truly blessed with that but uh what's the cross street on quail oh it's quail and oh gosh what is that corner there you know what i'm not 100 percent right there um but i'm dead center i'm like around the corner from the cuckoo's nest oh okay yeah. so like quail and western yeah, basically, but I'm, uh, my building is on a corner. So there's like a one way middle street there that uh, I, I'm just not gotcha. recalling like the name Elberon right now. Like or something Yeah, like so that. it's like a way, <laughs> they, uh, something like that is Great. Something, something there. Yeah, but not, not, not hard to miss on Quail Street for sure. Awesome. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get this, um, cle cleaned up, I guess. Um, and then it looks like we're going to recommend the the hr office items and then the the budget for cafe renovation stuff right and then um maybe we'll do something um in between august and october's meeting to try to get this um squared away sooner rather than later so you're not out another month um if we can get some of these answers really quickly and then tim's going to set up something it sounds like with the department heads in Mel, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I think that's all I have. Did anybody have anything else? Thank you again, Mel, for for coming. I know this was sort of, of I threw this at you last minute, but I figured. Nope. In happy the, to be in here. Just of time and back and forth, we just get everyone in the same place and. Not a problem. Try to no, I, yeah. Uh, happy to be a part of it, guys. You know, it's, it's, uh, I'm an open book here. I have been since day one with Tim and it's just a matter of, you know, we just want to make sure that we're getting this done and getting it done properly. <laughs> so we don't yeah. have any issues here. Yeah, for yep. sure. Cool. Right. No, thank you so much for Someday your time. We're going to just, you know, sit around and have a cup of coffee together. So that'll be nice. And so giggle right. about how difficult the growing pains are. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That works for yep. me. I'll have the cookies ready too. All right. I'm showing up just to see Tim giggle. Yeah, right. <laughs> I want a ticket to that uh, show. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Have a wonderful night. Giggle. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you too. And 922. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks for coming, Barbara.